So before we get started, I want to just uh, ask for your help for something. It was in my email yesterday, but we are not unique. Uh, like every church, whether you run 140 like we do or you run 25,000, summer is tough to get enough uh, people serving in different ministries. So if you would consider serving more often than you normally do through the summer months when you're in town, or if you don't serve, it'd be a great time to, to get started and at least help us through the next couple of months because we want to, uh, you know, we want to, when people come in, we want them to have greeters and all the different things that are important to Sunday morning. So uh, our children's ministry could sure use your help, our tech ministry, all of those things. So I just want to ask your help through the summer months for that. All right, well, let's get started. Let me ask you a question. Who's the most famous person that you've ever met? Nobody, me, you, I hear Don said me, which I very much appreciate. He actually said Bill Gates. I heard that. <laughs> I know he, he kind of hero worships me even at his old age. Um, I pick on him because I love Don. So if you're here and going, well, I just can't believe he said that. Um, all right. Well, I've actually had the opportunity to meet quite a few famous people over the years. It, some of that has been through my law firm and, and through the law business, but some of it has actually been as a pastor. I got to hang out and have a conversation with boxing champion Evander Holyfield and his dad one time, which was pretty cool. I got to have a conversation and hang out for a while with A.J. Green, who's an NBA basketball legend. Uh, I got to hang out with Daryl Strawberry for several hours. You knew Daryl? Yeah, yeah, Major League, but yeah, one of the great players of all time. Now he's a Christian speaker. I actually picked him up at the airport, and I checked him into the hotel the night before he was going to speak at our church. And when I was checking him into the hotel... The, he got a call on his cell phone, so he kind of stepped back and walked away from the check-in counter. And when he did that, the, the guy at the, the, the check-in counter goes, do you know who that is? <laughs> like, I'm with him. I'm like, uh, no, I, he was just uh, you know, standing out on the street, and I picked him up and brought him in. <laughs> I've had an opportunity to take a picture of my wife with John Travolta, which is pretty cool. I've met lots of Dallas Cowboy players and coaches and the owner over the years. I got to talk for a couple of minutes with Lawrence Taylor, the great New York Giant linebacker, one of the greats of all time. I've, I've gotten to, to meet a couple of presidents and senators and governors. Uh, maybe the coolest celebrity story, i got to tell it. Some of you have heard me tell it. But uh, the coolest one is I got to shadow box with Muhammad Ali. Not everybody gets to do that. Um, yeah, I met him at an M MLB All-Star game. He was walking by, and I just said, hey, champ, and he turned, and he looked at me, and he said, you and me, let's go. I have no idea what to do at that point, so I kind of put my hands up, kind of, you know, and like, I mean, and so he shuffles over to me, it was right before he passed away, actually, and shuffles over to me, and he takes a little, you know, a couple of jabs at me real softly, and I'm, you know, huh, you know, not knowing what to do, and, and then he gave me an autographed picture, which was really cool, but of all the cool just brushes with famous people I've had, my famous story, actually, in, in, in my best story involves my wife. Uh, so my wife uh, got to meet a celebrity, and it's really cool. Uh, I want to show you this book. This is George Foreman's Guide to Life. And if you look at the inside, it, it's just the book, but there's an, oh, looky there. To Nathan, my pal, George Foreman. We're close, me and George, or at least as far as you can tell from this book. <laughs> Let me tell you the story of how I got this autograph. It may come as a shock to some of you, but I'm not the most thoughtful person when it comes to birthdays and things like that. And so I often forget birthdays of like the people that work with me at the law firm or work with me here at the church. And so I had forgotten my secretary at the law firm's birthday a number of years ago. And in fairness to me, I did remember it when I walked into the office and her desk was decorated and it said happy birthday up above her chair. I immediately remembered it was her birthday at that point in time. So I called my wife and I said, I need a favor. So I need the perfect gift and I need it right now. And I need you to bring it to me at the law firm. Well, as you can imagine, she was not real thrilled with this last minute request, but because she is better than I deserve, she agreed to do it. And so she started driving in from Katy on I-10 towards the Galleria where my law firm offices are, and uh, she passed the Memorial City Mall that had just reopened up a number of years ago. They did a big remodel, and she saw that the Dillard's was open, so she whipped in there to buy a gift. And she goes into the Dillard's, and it, it's crazy packed. And so she's not real thrilled. She realizes it's now the grand opening for Dillard's, and there are people everywhere. But she finds the right gifts, and she gets in this long checkout line to check out. And she's standing in line. This book is sitting with a bunch of others on a little display case. 
So while she's waiting, she picks it up and she's kind of flipping through it. And as she's doing that, someone behind her says, so are you going to buy that book? And she laughed and said, does, does anybody really buy that book? <laughs> there was an awkward silence and she had this really uncomfortable feeling. She turns around, there's George Foreman right there. <laughs> So now she's scrambling because she is completely embarrassed. I would have loved to have been there to see the beautiful shades of red in my wife's face, maybe even have a video so you guys could have experienced it this morning. But she tries to, you know, get out of the hole that she's just dug. So she says, she says oh, well, you know, I, I would buy the book if you'd autograph it for me. And my, my, my close friend George, he says, uh, you see that line over there? And she looks, and there's just a long line of people standing with their George Foreman grills or their boxing gloves or this book, waiting patiently to have George Foreman sign it for them. And she goes, I, I don't have time to do that. And so he graciously offered to sign a couple of books uh, at that point. So she signed, he signed one for my secretary and then one for me, and I think he was being a little facetious, so he wrote this to my pal Nathan. So we're really close at this point. So I got an autographed copy of George Foreman's book. I also got a really good sermon story to tell. So if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to 2 Samuel chapter 9. It's in the Old Testament. And today we're kicking off a very short sermon series over the next four weeks where uh, we're calling it Yahweh. And we're looking at some of the attributes of God that God tells Moses about as he's given him the Ten Commandments on top of Mount Sinai. Well, Yahweh itself is one of the many names for God in the Old Testament. In fact, it's the most revered and holy name for God. And so the uh, Israelites would rarely say the name because it was so revered that they wouldn't say it. And eventually it was only said by the priests in the temple in Jerusalem. So Yahweh was written in ancient Hebrew like this. So if you, it's the top in yellow if you want to scratch that into your notes so you can go translate later. Um, or if you're using English letters, it's Y-H-W-H. Now, what's really cool about this that I didn't know, and I bet you don't know either, I learned it when I was getting ready for this sermon, is that Yahweh, we actually don't really know how to pronounce it at this point. Because the ancient Hebrew, they didn't write vowels in the written word. They just wrote, wrote the consonants. So that's why you have Y-H-W-H. The vowels were pronounced when they said the word. But because Yahweh was such a holy word, they, they didn't say it. So we've actually lost exactly how do you pronounce this word. And so modern linguists and Old Testament scholars aren't settled on how do you pronounce this word. And so there, there are pronunciations. Some think it's Yahweh, the way we'll pronounce it. But others is Yahweh. Other words are Yahweh. And the last one is Yehovah. So something else I learned is when you see the word Jehovah and the word Yahweh, those are the exact same Hebrew word. It is putting into English letters the way different people think we should pronounce it. So Jehovah and Yahweh, or the Lord, are all the same word. I didn't know that either. So the word Yahweh, or the name Yahweh, literally translates into the self-existing one, which is a great name for God because he is self-existing. No one created God. God created the universe, and he alone stands outside of space and time. And so his name means I've always existed. I'm the self-evident one or self-existent one. So the name Yahweh actually derives from another Hebrew word that means I am. And, and we see this the first time used in the Old Testament when God is talking to Moses through the burning bush. And Moses is coming up with all these different excuses why he can't lead the people out of Egypt. And the last excuse was, God, I don't even know who your name is. I mean, if they ask me who sent me, what do I tell them? And I love how God responds. Look at Exodus 3, 13 through 15 here. It says, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, there's that word Yahweh for the first time, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. There's where we see Yahweh for the first time in the Old Testament, and God says, this is my name, that's what you call me. But God has lots of names throughout the Bible. And they describe often his different attributes. And we may do a long sermon series sometime where we look at some different names of God in the Old Testament. 
but today we're just going to do a short four-week series. We're kicking that off about how God describes himself to Moses in Exodus chapter 34. So Moses is up on Mount Sinai to get the Old Testament law, the Ten Commandments, and write them on the stone tablets. Now, this is actually the second time he's up on Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments. The first time he goes up, they kind of had to do a mulligan because it kind of went south. I'll tell you that. So the first time Moses goes up, he gets the Old Testament law that included the Ten Commandments. He comes down off Mount Sinai, gets down, and he realizes that while he's up there getting the, the law from God with all the fire and smoke and pillars and lightning and all the stuff they can see up on the mountaintop, they get a little bored, the Israelites do, so they just make this big golden calf and they worship it. So he comes down with the Ten Commandments from God. He sees the golden calf. He gets so mad, he throws down the golden, I mean, the, the Ten Commandments, breaks them. So now we have to do it all over again. And so what we see here in Exodus 34 is the second time he's up on Mount Sinai. So let's look at that, verses 4 through 7. So Moses chiseled out the two stone tablets, like the first one, so it's saying this is the second time. And he went up to Mount Sinai early in the morning, as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, Yahweh, Yahweh, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin, Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generation. So in this, we see four different characteristics or traits that God gives to himself. And he says, I am these things. And so we're looking at the first one of those today, that God calls himself compassionate and gracious. And we're using an Old Testament story that illustrates this attribute. Now, this is a, an Old Testament story you may not have heard before, some of you, so I want to give you a little background. King David was anointed as king while the old king was still on the throne. That was King Saul. King Saul wasn't a very good king. He wasn't doing what God wanted him to do, so God decides to replace him, and he goes outside Saul's whole family, and then he anoints David. But there's a problem with that when King Saul is still on the throne and finds out that this young kid has been made the next king. King's a pretty good gig if you think about it, right? I mean, big palaces, lots of money, armies, you know, people calling you great and awesome all the time. And normally it has a lifetime appointment. So Saul is not real happy that there's some kid that's going to replace him. So he tries to kill David. David has to run off. And so King Saul gets an army and chases after David, hunting him down. And actually along the way, David has a couple of opportunities to kill King Saul but he doesn't do it because he loves and respects the king. Now, this conflict between King Saul and the next King David is even a little more complex because David's best friend, really close to a dude named Jonathan, they had, we were childhood buddies. They had made a commitment to always support one another no matter what and to be friends forever. They had this almost like a little ceremony. I remember when I was about nine, my best friend and I, we decided we were going to be best friends forever and so we did a ceremony called Spit Brothers. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, it's a very solemn and disgusting ceremony where you spit in your hands and then you, you know, uh, shake hands. I, I guess it's a little less painful than being blood brothers, but it's still kind of disgusting. So Jonathan and David have a similar ceremony. I don't think it involved any spit, but they commit to, to be for one another for all time. So you're probably wondering why that's a big deal, that David and Jonathan were close. Well, see, Jonathan is King Saul's oldest son, which makes him the heir to the throne when King Saul dies. But despite the fact that David is going to be the next king, Jonathan can, supports him and, and, and supports him when God anoints him as king. Well, long story short, Saul and Jonathan are both killed in a battle against the Philistines, who were some enemies of Israel. And as soon as that happened, man, it's, it's on. Because the king is gone, his heir is gone, and David is there. So you immediately have David becomes king over part of Israel. One of Saul's remaining sons becomes king over the other part of Israel. And civil war ensues. And there's this big fight. David wins, and almost all of King Saul's heirs die in the battles. Now, I'm skipping over some intrigue and secret alliances and murders and all that that would even excite some of you guys that watch Game of Thrones. It could stick with that. 
But David, in long story short, becomes this great and powerful king. In 2 Samuel 8, 6, it says, the Lord gave David victory wherever he went. And the rest of, rest of that chapter talks about how David is setting up all the administration and, and preparing to be king and rule wisely and well. And then in verse 15, it says, David reigned over all of Israel doing what was just and right for all his people. So chapter 9 is where our story picks up. David is sitting back. He's thinking about all that he's accomplished to that point, and, and he remembers his friend Jonathan who was killed. And he wants to figure out what he can do to honor Jonathan's memory and, and to repay Jonathan's loyalty and love for him even when things were difficult. Let's pick up our story in 2 Samuel 9, verses 1 through 8. David asked, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David, and the king said to him, are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, he is at the house of Machir, son of Amiel in Lodabar. So the king, so King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the lands that belong to your grandfather Saul. Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? So what's happening here is you've got this guy named Mephibosheth, and I wish he had an easier name to say because I'm going to have to say it a bunch today. It almost sounds like a sneeze, <laughs> Mephibosheth, <laughs> but I've got to say it. But what's important is that Mephibosheth is the last remaining heir of Saul, but he's also crippled from a childhood accident that's related to all the intrigue and infighting in the palace. He's the only one to survive the Civil War. And, and I, I bet Mephibosheth thinks maybe David has forgotten that there's still an heir of Saul alive. Because as you, if you've watched or read books about you know, transitions from one king to the next, having heirs alive from the prior king is a dangerous thing. Mephibosheth thinks, well, maybe David just doesn't care about me because I'm lame. I can't really walk, so he doesn't really consider me a threat. So he's hiding out outside Israel in this little, little dumpy town. We'll talk a little more about it in a minute. But he thinks that King David has forgotten about him until one day there's a knock at the door and somebody says, hey, uh, King David wants to have a little chat with you. We're going to take you back to the palace. And, and I'm sure that he thought that King David was going to kill him to make his claim to the throne complete. So Mephibosheth is brought to the throne room, and he slowly walks with, uh, with his lame foot up to King David, and he says, what, what, do you, what do you want? And King David says, don't be afraid. It's not, you're not here for what you think you are. I, I want to treat you well. I want to be gracious and compassionate to you, and I want to treat you as one of my own sons and let you eat at the king's table. And, and so what we see in this story is the compassion and graciousness of King David. And so you're thinking, well, that's a great story. It'd probably be a good story to tell kids at bedtime or whatever. I mean, it sounds good. But what does that have to do with me? Everything. Because this story of King David and Mephibosheth shows us how our king relates to us, that he is compassionate and gracious. I think about this like looking in the mirror. So when you look at the mirror of this story and you see King David and Mephibosheth, you really see a reflection of us. We're Mephibosheth. And you see our king in Jesus and how that works. It's this beautiful illustration of us. And I love how God sets up the Old Testament so that all of these true historical stories paint pictures for us of our relationship with God. And they show that God, his different attributes and traits, and he shows the plan to redeem his people from their sin. And so in this story, we see a picture of God's compassion and graciousness toward us. All right, look back at 2 Samuel 9, 3 through 4. The king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Well, where is he, the king asked. Ziba answered, he is at the house of Machir, son of Amiel, in Lodabar. So at the beginning of this story, Mephibosheth 
has a couple of big problems. The first problem is that he is lame, that he is handicapped. He is crippled because of a childhood injury. And if you go back to chapter 4 of 2 Samuel, you see how this happens. So when Saul and Jonathan are killed in battle, everybody knows David's about to take over. And so at the palace, when word gets back that the king and the heir have died in battle, they start cleaning house because they know David's about to drop by with an army and he's probably going to want to take over. So they're rushing around trying to get all the young princes out of the palace and away from the area. And as they're rushing around, Mephibosheth's nurse drops him and he gets injured so badly that he struggles to walk for the rest of his life. Well, Mephibosheth is a pretty good picture of us because we are crippled by our sin and our mistakes. Every single one of us is broken and imperfect, without exception. Romans 3.10 says it this way, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. So we're all in this together. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all have this crippling, debilitating, terminal sickness called sin. And, And there's nothing we can do about that. If you're visiting with us and you don't really like churches because you think they're filled with messed up people that are broken, i got bad news for you. You're right. <laughs> you pegged us. You're more right than you even know. But if you're here today and you're thinking you're the only one that has problems and struggles with sin, I've got good news for you. We're, we're all in this together. Every single one of us struggles with this crippling, debilitating thing called sin. Can, can, can you just imagine if there was a perfect church? Right, if, if there were perfect people and a perfect church, I want to go to that church. So I would show up at that church, I would join that church, and then I'd mess it up for everybody. They'd all be mad at me because I messed up their perfect church. But, but there is no perfect church because there are no perfect people. Look, I, I mess up all the time. I, I'm not as kind and caring as I should be sometimes. I don't always treat my wife the way she deserves. Sometimes I have these thoughts in my head that are just bad and wrong. I struggle with pride sometimes. I can be selfish and think only about myself. I'm broken, and you are too. Maybe you struggle with anger or bitterness or hate, and as hard as you try, you just can't get past it. Or or maybe it's greed or pride or selfishness. Maybe it's an addiction to drugs or alcohol. Maybe you're being torn apart by sexual sin or pornography, and it's tearing your life apart. Just like Mephibosheth, we're all broken and crippled. And and Mephibosheth, he got a second problem. So first problem is he's crippled. But the second is he's far from home. He is out of the kingdom. He is away from the king, separated. Lodabar was actually this little, little town that really had no food. Actually, the name in Hebrew, Lodabar, actually means the place of no grazing. In other words, there's no food here. That's where he's living. It was part of a desert. I'm sure there wasn't even a Dairy Queen or a Sonic in that little town. He was once a prince, and now he's exiled from the king and living away. And like Mephibosheth, we're in the same condition. We're separated from God. Isaiah 59.2 says it this way, But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So just like Mephibosheth, we're broken by sin and we're separated from our king, King Jesus. And if this feels like a bit of a downer of a sermon at this point in time, that we're just getting to the good part. Stay with me. Even though we're broken and lost and we're in this desperate state of sin, here's the first point you need to remember. We are sought by the king. See, King David is seeking to find Mephibosheth. Look back at 2 Samuel 9, 1. He says, David asks, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And then down in verse 5, it says, King David had him brought from Lodabar from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. What do we see here? Mephibosheth is not searching for the king. In fact, he's doing just the opposite. He is hiding from the king. But the king seeks him out. The king is looking for him to have a relationship with with him because of his compassion and mercy. What a beautiful picture that is of our relationship with Jesus who came to us to search us out, to find us. Jesus says it this way in Luke 19, 10. He says, for the son of man, Jesus would often call himself the son of man, came to seek and to save the lost. We get this beautiful picture of the king searching for us, 
seeking us out. Jesus would often describe himself as the good shepherd. And what does the good shepherd do? He leaves the 99 sheep that are already there, and he goes out to find the one that's lost. And so we get this image over and over of the king, our king, searching for us, looking for us so that he can bring us home and restore us to the family. When my second daughter, Cameron, was about three years old, we went over to San Antonio to watch a show called Blue's Clues Live. Y'all know what Blue's Clues is? Yeah, it was a Nickelodeon show back in the late 90s, early 2000s, and my two oldest daughters big time into Blue's Clues. So we went over to see the live version of it in San Antonio, and we we sat down and we watched the the first half, and like so many live shows, it had an intermission in the middle. During the intermission, we went out in the lobby, we got some, you know, drinks and some snacks, and then right before the second part started, we headed back to our seats, and we had three kids at that time, so we're herding all these little kids in, and as we get down to our row and we start heading down the aisle, I realize Cameron's not with us. And, and so at first I was pretty calm about it. I said, Lil, where's Cam? And she looks around. Suddenly we realize she's, she's not with us. So we're looking around. We're pretty calm at this point. We figure she's just on a row behind us or whatever. So we're looking around, and we don't see her anywhere. And, and at this point, I'm starting to panic a little. And so I'm like, I'm going to go talk to a security guard. And, and so I go back, you know, I'm going to the back of the room, and I'm looking at every aisle and seat as I go back. And, and I tell the security guard when I get to the back, I said, that we, we've lost our daughter. And, and, and he said, what, is, what does she look like? So well, she's got blonde hair, and she's wearing a little pink Blue's Clues T-shirt. And so then it starts to get a little crazy because he gets on his walkie-talkie thing, and he says, we have a code, blah, blah, blah. I don't remember what it was, but it was to shut the theater down. So all the doors now are shut and locked, and there's security guards standing at every entrance to keep anybody from going in and out. And so me and this security guard were running around trying to find my daughter. I'm looking for Blonde-haired little girl with pink Blue's Clues t-shirt. We're looking, and we can't find her, and I'm starting to panic. The, the show starts back up, but security is still helping us look with flashlights, and, and we're looking, and I'm just constantly, where, where's the where's blonde hair, pink shirt? Blonde hair, pink shirt, and we can't find her. And, and so in a few moments that seem like hours to me, the radio comes on and someone says that they'd found a a little blonde girl on the third floor balcony with a pink shirt and she was apparently down at the front peeking over the rail watching Blue's Clues with tears running down her face. Now you got to admit, you got to appreciate her commitment to Blue's Clues. She's lost and scared but she still finds a spot where she can watch the show. So I run up the stairs with this security guard and sure enough another guard is bringing her back towards the back as we get to the third floor. And I run to her, and she runs to me, and I pick her up. She's got tears running down her face. I've got tears running down my face. And I said, baby, why would you leave us? And she said, I I thought I saw mommy at the back. And so I chased after her. But then she went up the stairs, and I followed her. But when I got up there, it wasn't mommy. And, And I thought, I have three, or at that point I had two other kids. But none of that mattered. I was missing one, and I wanted to find her. I was desperate to find that little girl with blonde hair and a pink shirt. And I can just imagine Jesus searching for those of us who are lost. Little girl, blonde hair, pink shirt. Little blonde girl, pink shirt. With that same desperation, he is searching us out, looking for us. We are being pursued by the king. And that's the illustration that we get from this Old Testament story. The king is filled with compassion, and he's searching for Mephibosheth. Our king is searching for us. All right, so it's already a good story, but it gets even better. So first of all, we're sought by the king, but the second part is we're invited by the king. Look back at 2 Samuel 9, 7. Don't be afraid, David said to him, he's talking to Mephibosheth here, for I will surely show you the kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore you to all the lands that belong to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. So he gives him all of this land that belonged to Saul, and Ziba, who was the servant of Saul, becomes the new servant of Mephibosheth, and he's going to take care, he's told he's going to take care of all the lands with his son. And then here's what Ziba says in verse 11. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. And I love how this ends. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. You've got this beautiful picture of, of somebody who was crippled, who was separated from the king, and it ends when the king shows his compassion and love 
and allows him to eat at the king's table like one of the king's sons. I wish I had an illustration for you from my own life on this, but I don't. I've met lots of famous people, but not one single one of them has invited me over for dinner. I'm a little, I'm a little frustrated by that, but it's never happened. But so think about that. What if your U.S. senator or what if the president of the United States said, hey, why don't you come over and eat with my family tonight? That'd be kind of similar, except it's even bigger than that. Mephibosheth is told by King David, why don't you come over and eat and hang out every night? Be a part of my family. Come over, we'll play games, we'll play cornhole and video games or whatever they did back then. And we have to understand what that must feel like to be invited into the king's family. And here's something important to understand about this story. Mephibosheth doesn't get treated like one of the sons of the king because of anything he did. David treats Mephibosheth with graciousness and love because of what Jonathan did. Think about that. Because of David's great love for Jonathan and because of Jonathan's love and support for David, he then adopts Mephibosheth into part of his family. That sounds a little like us too in the mirror, right? We don't get to become children of God or children of the king because of anything we've done. Because of what Jesus did for us, because our king died for us, we're restored to the king. Listen how the Apostle Paul says this in Ephesians 2, 11 through 13. He says, therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles, that's us, by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, or that's the Jews, which is done in the body by human hands. Listen to this next part. Remember that at the time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, we're restored to the king. Everything is different because we now have a relationship with our perfect God. The reality is that Mephibosheth was an enemy of King David. He was a remaining heir of Saul. That's who he was. And we're an enemy of God because of our sin. We worship a very holy God, a God who can't stand sin, can't even stand to look at it or be in its presence. And so we have this huge problem. But because of what Jesus did... We become adopted sons and daughters of the king when we follow him. We have an opportunity to be restored. We're invited to be a part of the king's table. This illustration is set up so beautifully by the the 23rd Psalm. A lot of you guys know that. A lot of you guys have memorized it, but you've certainly read it or seen it on a wall somewhere. But it's this beautiful picture of what this relationship between us and our king looks like. We don't know exactly when uh, King David is the one that wrote it. We don't know when he did that, but let's... I want us to read it together, and so we're going to read it out loud. We're going to read it slowly, but I don't ask you guys to do that very often, but let's read the 23rd Psalm together. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the picture of what happens between David and Mephibosheth. He says, come hang out at my table. Be a part of my family. And and he says, you can do that for the rest of your life. That's this beautiful picture of us and our relationship with God. There's this, it ends with this idea of that God is this king and he's hosting this incredible banquet. And and we get to be guests at that banquet. We get to sit at the table with the king and we're anointed with, with oil, which would have been the perfume for honored guests. It's a beautiful picture. And then just like Mephibosheth got to live with the king for the rest of his life, We get one bigger than that. It ends by says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's how the story ends. This is this beautiful picture of these attributes of God. He is compassionate and gracious. The king loves us. He sought us out. Then he invited us to be his children, to be part of his family. That's the story of Mephibosheth. It's the 23rd Psalm. It's what it says. We are restored to the king because of his 
compassion and love. Let's pray.